Okay, here okay, it is. Here it is. Yep. Here you go. All right. So here we go. Okay. So I suppose you all see that. Yep. I hope so. All right. So this is actually I uh, this graph library or whatever that we want to present briefly was actually developed by some students of mine at Texas A&M. And it's in particular, the talk is by Adam Fidel. Uh, I tried to convince him to give the talk, but he kind of was, because he's working now, I mean, he is actually gainfully employed, probably making twice as much as I do. Um, he kind of bailed out on me. So I have to give the talk. So you, I'm obviously, I'm not going to do as good of a job as he could, but you're going to just have to bear with me. So um, in uh, with about graph processing, you all know, and I'm not going to repeat in this audience that graph analytics is common uh, is commonplace, and that to grace uh, graphs of interest are very large, actually. Lawrence. Yes. The, uh, we are not seeing, seeing the slideshow. We're seeing the uh, presentation. Oh, yeah, yeah, OK. All right, all right. Sorry, sorry. Let me see the slideshow. Hmm. Oh, at the bot bottom, maybe. OK, that's better, I think. No, uh, no, no it's not. Now it is actually the presenter view, sorry. Uh, Maybe it was better how it was. Okay, custom view. Did you try uh, play from current side? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So, do you see that? Yep. Okay, because I don't. Oh. Okay. Oh no, it's not it. Ah. Because when you do escape, it's escape to to PowerPoint. Oh. It does not do the escape to uh, to the zoom. So then anyway. you can go back to your previous view. That's fine. This That's is okay. okay. Can you see that? Yeah, we can see your slide right now. Okay, fine. So that's okay. Well, what happens when you go to the next? We'll see. Okay. Well, we'll see. Yeah. This is what happens. Looking fine. Yep. Yeah. So. Uh, the problem was the, some of the problems with current graphs is that the traversal exhibit irregular axis patterns, right? You have very poor locality. Uh, there are ways, of course, to fix it to a certain extent. Structural dependencies limit the parallelism. So graphs, by definition, are not parallel almost. Um, the computation is because it's very irregular, the computation is imbalanced. Partitioning is challenging. And the portability of paragraph processing uh, software, if you want, to different platform is, let's just say, challenging. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you something about uh, some of the work that we developed some time ago about bounded asynchrony. That means uh, in the idea that um, asynchronous uh, algorithms or asynchronous graph algorithms are somehow perform better. So here, level synchronous, you all know that one, the BSP model, right? Is uh, this is a little animation that my students always like to do. Uh, it's, let's say you take a BFS and you traverse it synchronously, and then you another step, right? And then finally you, you get it. And if you want, so there are a couple of steps that you have to go through and means that there are global synchronization, so you have to pay for that. If you do a synchron async, completely synchronous, right? Then you traverse it in one shot, basically. There is no global synchronizations involved. And that's actually quite useful because supposedly you're going to finish faster, provided that you can do exactly the same work. That, of course, is not really true. Um, and we are going to have some delays because of that, because you're going to do extra work to get 
a faster um, execution. So work suboptimal, right? If you would look at it in in, uh, in uh, more theoretical terms. So here we have a little plot, and this is the synchronization cost, right? So if you go level synchronous, right, the synchronization cost is fairly high, right? And as you go completely asynchronous to the other extreme, synchronization cost is very low. However, the redundant work that you will do, because think about the BFS, if you are asynchronous, you're going to have to redo a lot of work because things arrive whenever they feel like arriving at the various nodes. There, the, the redundant work is actually going to be more, I mean, more and more pronounced, the more the asynchrony is going to basically diameter of the graph. So what we did, since we saw this kind of plot, if you want, we decided that perhaps uh, there is some kind of a sweet spot in between, right? So that would be the sweet spot that where we can actually do the most asynchrony with uh, the least amount of redundant work. And perhaps that runs faster. And in fact, it does, at least for certain kind of graphs. So here is the, we, what we have also provided in uh, uh, this uh, stable graph library is a very simple way of writing the code. So you have a vertex operator and you have a neighbor operator. So if here is a very simple example, right? And what you do to every node, right? And here you go to the neighbor operator, you operate on the neighbors, right? With a neighbor operator, you have to write it as a programmer too, right? Process a neighbor and process the thing. Now, um, hmm, something is missing, but so the, what you want is to minimize the predicted execution time. So the penalty for the, the notate, you know, psi GK graph and K, the increasing asynchrony. Execution time approximated by, hmm, I'm sorry, something is wrong with the animation. Okay, so we're just going to have to live with that. Okay, the picture can't be displayed. I don't know why. Hmm. I had it before. This has been happening to me lately. What seems to be the problem is that if you store it on some kind of a remote drive uh -huh. and edit it, it loses these pictures. So the only hope is if you have a previous version of it. Well, I'm trying. Like, I don't know if it is Box or Google Drive, but my suspicion is Google it's Box. Drive. It's, it's Box because if I went anywhere, yeah. Okay, hang on a second. Let's save as, and, well, I was in PowerPoint actually, so let me go and save it. But it's very different. I mean, I lost all those things and I had to redo them. Last yeah, well, that's exactly what happens to me now. So let me go to my, I'm going to kill this guy. Okay. Now. Okay, so now let's see if I share now. The question is, ah, okay, I'm share screen and
Okay. So let's see if this one works. Yeah, this one works. It was not saved on box or whatever it was. On box actually. So are we back in business? Yeah, hmm. we are. We are. Oh, okay. All right. We're not seeing the whole screen, but that's okay. I... Uh, let's see. PowerPoint. I, I can see everything. It's not full screen, but I can see the slides fine. Yeah, I can see. It. Yeah. Play from the, yeah, that's the part. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Is that now yeah. nicer? Okay, good. So this was the penalty. So we tried to model this so that we can actually optim optimize for the K, right? So if we go to various levels, right? There are K level asynchronous, right? And K, the question was how many uh, steps can we go asynchronously before we have a global synchronization? So here is the tower. Okay. So how many steps? Well, the time to execute, right? Oops. Is the work plus the redundant work plus the time to do the global synchronization. Okay. So we try to minimize this execution time, right? Computing this one is fairly expensive, right? The, the redundant code, the work, redundant work. So we, well, of course, we can try to model it theoretically some, some more, and it's all written up in the, in the paper. However, there is a, a more of an adaptive system that we have it, uh, figured out, which is actually more practical. So that means if the degree that we are, right, is larger than some constant, then k is equal to 1. So if you have a power graph, right, that starts with a lot of edges going out a very high degree, then it is no point in having, you know, asynchronous com uh, computation. Else, if the degree is not that, oops, not that big, then uh, we compare the previous step, the time for the previous step with the current step here, these two. And if it's larger than a certain threshold, then we half the k, else we double it. So basically, it's adaptive. If we're doing a good job, you know, in the beginning, then we try to increase the asynchrony. If uh, if the job is not very good, it means we're kind of uh, it's it's going slower. Then we try actually to reduce it. Of course, this is very empirical, and I'm sure that there are better models for it. But for us, it worked fine. So. This is what you can see actually. So this is in red. It is our method, right? Up to 96,000 processors. And then if you do the BS, well, the level synchronous, right? The BSP style, then you kind of get it here, right? So it changes once the number of processors is higher and you're more dominated by communication, then the, uh, the execution time starts increasing. So it's certainly not scalable. And if you have completely asynchronous, which you kind of would like, but does it really work? Then, of course, at higher levels of uh, at higher processor numbers, it's the execution time becomes very high. So the KLS strategy, you know, scales better and it's a little bit faster. We try to be adaptive to that. Um, what? We do that is also BFA. This is one uh, Cray, our, used to be our Cray. I mean, it still is, but I don't, nobody uses it. Um, various uh, graph inputs, right? And if it shows that our adaptivity or our adaptive ske uh, scheme, how far it is from the optimal K, right? Because you can run them exhaustively and find out what is the optimal K for it, for us, okay? And this is how with the adaptive system that we told you before, um, it's actually pretty close to, to ideal, except this one, and I can't tell you why. We used KLA also in other frameworks that was courtesy actually of a reviewer. 
says, can you use it in some other places? Of course, we can use it outside Staple and outside SGL. So we actually did a modified level synchronous uh, work list for Galois, for the system that comes out of uh, UT to allow for the scale, the scheme, the scale A schemes, right? So the, these are the improvements depending on the graph type, right? So these are the various types of graphs. And these are the improvement. This is a speed up of KLA over what they are doing without KLA. So sometimes there is no speed up at all, sorry. Uh, sometimes there is no speed up at all. And sometimes there is quite a bit of it, right? So it's basic, there is never a slowdown. So it's actually, there is no reason not to do it. BFS press first search from scratch, right? Use distances to compute reachability given, uh, and, uh, okay. So how much of Twitter is reachable in three hops? That was actually the, and we had some uh, ICI that was hidden actually in the previous one. So, Guys, you have to live with a, uh, a presentation that was not massaged for this workshop. Um, because I saved it the wrong place. This is how the, it actually looks like the code. And I'm not going to go through the code here, but this is pretty simple how to write it. And then here is a vertex operator. And here you, um, these are standard step, you know, SDL algorithms for each, right? But they are in, in stable, they are for in parallel, right? And here we initialize the distance. But it's, it's not particularly exciting to show in a, if there was a, a demo basically at supercomputing. So you traverse K hops before there is a global barrier. Then this is the result up to quite a few. The way that you change this, right, is that you have this graph paradigm, right, and you have to give the G, right, and it, it doesn't change very much the way that you express it. Right. If you had change it to this KLA paradigm, then you just have to specify K. That's all. There is no other modification to your code. Well, to your code, to our code at least. Okay. So it's a very easy, what I was trying to show you is that it is a very easy to obtain. Okay, that wasn't working either. It was very easy to uh, obtain a, um, a basically for free faster performance asynchronously, and it is very easy to write one. So you don't have to modify your entire software. Uh, another thing that we, I kind of wanted to show you is that <clears throat> something that we are going to work some more on is the approximation. So shortest pass between, the problem is, uh, it's just an example, basically. The shortest pass between pair of vertices in a graph, right? And there are many applications rely on that. So what we do is that we use approximation to use to reduce the work that we're going to do, and in essence also the execution time. So as an example, approximate distances between vertices, right? You have all the unweighted graphs, parallel press first, search, and so forth. We use the asynchronous BFS, right? And we increase the asynchrony by reducing redundant work, right? It is what I showed you before, right? Now, here is a traversal in asynchrony, right? Here there is a problem because you come on different paths and they don't match, right? So what, do, what is the approximation? So if we decide as we have a, a joining node that the distance, you know, the, the old distance from the new distance, right? The ratio over the distance of the error, if you want, is larger than a certain amount, we will propagate it. Else, 
we are going to be having some tolerance, basically, we define a tolerance, and we are not going to redo the work. So you can, you know, you can, you, you, the work might be done, perhaps, to find this out, but you're not going to have to redo the work from then on. Right? So you come on two paths. That's perhaps a little bit, you have to traverse actually the entire graph. And then you, when you get to a node where these two are compared, the distances are compared, if they are not you know, too far apart, you're just going to continue with what you had before. And of course, this propagates, right? So um, if it's larger than four, so if, it, if you put a tolerance to 0.4, right, then you're going to have to propagate three, you pick up three, right? And then this one, if it's 0.6, then there is a problem, right? So you have to redo it. So if you have used this approximative or approximate neighbor operator and the neighbor operator, right? This is a difference really. So you see that we didn't change very much from the code, from the one that is, you know, the original code, non-approximate to the one that is approximate. It's just one line of code. It's pretty easy, it's very clean. And the error now, of course, when you do approximation, the whole trick is that you find also error bounds. So you have to bound your error because just by running it a million times and saying that it was not too bad is, it works, but well, to a certain degree, but it's really empirical, and we would like to actually uh, bind it a little, bound it a little bit better than that. So this is an attempt to that, to do just that, right? So this is exact distance. This is distance with some approximations, right? So at the end of the algorithm, more reach you have a distance of this one right here, k times dv, right? Because it's a number of times that you do approximations. And there is, of course, a proof that is more formal and is in the paper. Uh, again, the old Texas road network, if you hate it, I mean, I, we should probably substitute it with Illinois road network, but it's probably Illinois is a smaller state. So it's, it's a bigger graph, the Texas road network. So the exact algorithm, right, is worse with higher asynchrony. So if we try to actually get it, you know, this is the level synchronous, this is an improvement, and then it goes up, depending for which one. Now, if the tolerance is 0.5, right, is faster with higher asynchrony, right? But it gives you an error. So the question is, you know, you have to make a trade-off between this, okay, so you can see here that as the error increases or decreases, right? So here is 0.5 and you go down here. This is execution time, number of uh, hops, right? I mean, sorry, K, the number of hops between synchronizations. So what you ideally want, right, is a very large K uh, for any tolerance, also the maximum tolerance that you can actually obtain. And uh, here for K is equal to five, you get actually quite a fairly high K. I mean, the, the, uh, the performance is actually pretty good. But there is some error. So the question is, what do you do with the error? Well, it's each user will tolerate different errors. All what we can do is model it and offer basically knobs and you have to actually enter how much you want. And you're gonna run that way. You cannot and hopefully run faster or better or whatever, right? But you cannot possibly decide for the user what error is acceptable because you don't know how it's going to use it. So each algorithm that we are going to have, a graph algorithm, let's say, with a certain error, any tolerance to error, so any approximative algorithm will have to have some input from the user to decide how big it is. Now, how do they compose? That's a different story. 
Um, this is approximative BFS runtime on the road network on the blue gene at the time, BGQ, with so, so many processors, 32,000 processors and K is equal to 32, that means 32 hops. So you can see here that the tau is, you, you know, it's zero, right? So there is no, this is exact basically. And this is, as you go down here, then the approximate at some point, but point one or whatever, you kind of reach as much as you're gonna, the, the that execution, you reduce the execution time for as much as you can. And beyond that, it doesn't make much of a difference. And here, is the relative error, right? It grows from zero, right? From nothing. And it goes up, up to a point, and then it kind of stays flat for a certain time. So obviously you want to get the maximum advantage out of it beyond without going to higher errors. There's no advantage to do that. Now, this is something that my uh, student added in that I could not, I'm going to have to go through it because um, I cannot show what I uh, prepared for this talk. So there is current work, right? We have distributed graph processing, right? And we use Frontier. So this is, well, the, this work has been actually finished. So uh, when we traverse a graph, there and traverse it say in the BFS manner or something like similar to that, there is an active frontier. How many nodes or vertices are active at in one time? So he added this frontier concept that is actually not that new to uh, collect a set of active vertices in a traversal. And what is collecting the frontier into, there are various types of data structures if you want that uh, may or may not be the best. And it's, it's kind of a experimental what they're trying to do. High level type information from user to select efficient implementation, right? So how the frontier grows, right? It would be useful to know from the user or some other ways, some information about the graph that you uh, are playing with. And this is another thing that we are trying to figure out to make some kind of a taxonomy or some kind of a statistics about the various graphs and how they would influence the performance of the various algorithms. And here is a result with frontier. So the blue one is stored the frontier in a vector, right? And then the without it, right? So depending on, on K also, the uh, execution time, putting the frontier in a vector only of the active vertices. There is also another system I have to say that developed by somebody else that right now the name escapes me, where the frontier is very useful because you can also go backwards in the BFS from the end to the back. Rigorous study of feature for optimal values of asynchrony. We hope that we can do it. It's not very clear that it is possible, right? non vertice centric model or edge centric, we will, the, and the partitioning also of the graph is uh, quite important. In conclusion, I think that I convinced you that obviously synchrony is good for you. Bounded asynchrony is probably more realizable, more realistic, right? And you can tra trade it off the asynchrony with uh, error. So you can actually play between the two, right? Because when you're using synchrony, you still have synchronization points. And at that point, you're going to have to somehow get rid of your error. Because beyond that, you are not accumulating error. In between, you do. So the, okay, the larger the K, the more error accumulation you do. The synchronization point is a time you know where you can clean things up. And that's it. Sorry about the. Uh, the mess up with the slides. No worries. Were there any questions? Hmm. Okay. 
So would you, do you say that you have more, later results in the other, other presentation? No, so, well, this is the presentation that the student wanted to show that he didn't want to do any effort, put any effort into it. Oh, oh I see, okay. okay. Okay, I was going to say he that- He has more because he still has not defended yet. So he has more <laughs> results. Okay. In particularly, I'll, I'll... he has the hierarchical, uh, I we, I, we, I kind of skipped it because it's not completely ready. Yeah. It means it's not, it, this is all on uh, GitLab and that part is not on GitLab yet. So when it's going to be on GitLab, then it's going to be ready. Then he can also talk about it. Okay. Okay. No, I, I just thought there's some result that existed. Then you could put a link to it here is what I was suggesting. Ah. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there is everything that I told you is actually available on GitLab can be downloaded. There are lots of actually uh, okay. algorithms. Uh, here you are, some of them, right, that uh, are available. Okay. Right, right, right. Okay. Any yeah, other questions? Nice to know. No. like i don't see any other questions on the google doc either so okay on the google doc there is a google doc uh, oh, i see yeah. uh, chat oh i see he, somebody told me there are five minutes remaining but i think they can't tell it in time mm, okay all right thank you all right